When I was 17 years old, I was in my room one night working on my trigonometry homework when I heard two sounds I will never forget. The first was the schlink of a knife being drawn from the knife holder in the kitchen. And the second was my father's voice saying, Linda, no! I ran into the kitchen and I found my parents scuffling with a knife and called 911. The police came and luckily no one had been hurt. But the next day my mother was gone. This was the first of many psychiatric hospitalizations that followed. My life turned upside down that day. My former Girl Scout troop leader, room mother, doll clothing sewer, song singer, story reader, my mother had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And it wasn't very clear whether she'd been suicidal or homicidal that night. To this day, I still don't really know. What I do know now is that I was woefully unprepared for the years that followed, and that no one at the time gave me any advice about how to help my mother. I wish someone had. My talk here today is what I wish someone had told me when I was 17, so it wouldn't have taken me 20 years to learn what I learned through trial and error. I hope maybe it will help save one of you a little time and a lot of hard lessons. These are my lessons from my mother. First of all, accept the situation. Take a deep breath. It'll help ease the panic you may be feeling because you've just found out someone you love, perhaps a parent or child, a sibling or spouse, has been diagnosed with a mental illness. Mental illness is still quite stigmatized in our society and rather taboo. So when the subject does arise, we often feel very uncomfortable talking about it. But if we want to help, talk we must. And help we can. Please do not feel like there is nothing you can do. I assure you, there is. I know life may seem very turned upside down right now. And you may be tempted to pretend that nothing has changed and everything is just fine. Do not do this. Denial does not work. And it can have serious consequences. Secondly, reach out. Don't keep this a secret. Find allies and develop a network of support for you and your loved one. I remember one time, my mother was being hospitalized and I was very worried about her. My parents were divorced by this point, and I was her main caregiver. She was being paranoid, unreasonable, hard to work with, and I didn't know what to do. So I turned to a neighbor, who's now one of my best friends, and told her about my situation, even though I was nervous to do so. It turned out she had a sister who'd been suffering from a mental illness, a serious mental illness, for years. And at the time, I didn't even know she had a sister. So. You may be surprised just how many people are in exactly your same shoes. In fact, according to NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, one in five Americans will suffer from a mental illness. That's 43 million Americans in any given year. One in 25 live with a serious mental illness. If these numbers are at all surprising, it's because not enough people talk about it. Hopefully, however, it would also help me bring you some comfort knowing that you and your loved one are not alone. So, once you accept the situation, reach out and develop a network of support, what else can you do? Plenty. Obviously, not everyone's situation is going to be the same. Some people, once the initial psychiatric crisis is over, may be fine for years. Others, however, may suffer for years. There's a wide spectrum of experience when it comes to mental illness. There are, however, a few general rules of thumb I recommend you follow if you truly want to help your loved one. First off, make sure your help is wanted. 
You cannot help someone who does not want your help. I learned this the hard way. It has to be a two-way street. You need to communicate clearly and kindly with each other about what sort of help is wanted by them and what sort of help can be given by you. This will not always match up, but an agreement needs to be reached or much heartache will follow. Remember, even if you see them suffering and you just want to make it all better, you cannot live, your li live their life for them, even if you think you know best how to help them. No, you must listen carefully to what they really need and what they really want from you. You may be surprised. And if you don't listen carefully, you may miss it. And one thing they may want and may not ask for is total reassurance of your love for them through all of it. Because mental illness can bring some hard times and it can do some real damage along the way. After all, at times it removes all those filters of politeness and thoughtfulness and all sorts of things they may not say in their healthier moments come out unabridged, unsoftened, raw, sometimes paranoid and often painful. This is why mental illness can be murder on relationships. And it leads me to my next point. If you want to help a loved one with a mental illness, you have to develop a thick skin and learn to not take things too personally. I cannot emphasize this enough. Try instead to see their verbal assaults when they come, as they likely will, <laughs> as signs of an illness symptoms of an illness, just as you would a fever or a rash. Use them to help you determine when they may be in need of more significant support or intervention. Don't engage and argue that they're being irrational, especially if they are indeed being irrational. <laughs> but take heart and try to see the opportunity here as well. Because of their filterlessness, you may actually get to know them more deeply than you would someone who is fully healthy and can always keep their emotions under wraps. In fact, in the process, you may even learn a, two or thing, learn a thing or two about yourself that no one else would be willing to tell you. But you will only reap these benefits if you can learn to weather the emotional storms that may very well be directed right at you because you love them and they know that. And this makes you a safe outlet and sometimes a close target. Of course, you should never tolerate any physical abuse from anyone ever. But verbal abuse may very well crop up at a time of emotional distress. And it is up to you to choose how you see it. Again, I recommend that you try to see it <clears throat> as a red flag, a cry for help, and not take it too personally. Stay safe. but try to be forgiving of these moments if you can. I think it is these very moments that most often drive people away from loved ones with a mental illness. I know initially they drove me away from my mother, first halfway across the country for college, then halfway around the world for the Peace Corps. It turned out that physical distance didn't really help matters much. But when I learned to accept her emotional storms as part of her condition, and to fully listen and reassure her lovingly during them, even when it was hard, even when unfair things were being said, the things actually began to get easier, surprisingly. And we grew much closer. In fact, this technique would usually help her calm her down better than anything else. So, what's another way you can help? Well. Financially, of course. For the first 10 years after my mother's initial diagnosis, she did quite well with medication and therapy, and she was able to work full time and to live independently. Over time, however, certain things began to be overwhelming. Keeping track of finances and paying bills on time could be a challenge, especially if she'd had a manic episode and gone on a shopping spree. So. I offered to help manage her money, and she agreed. I would 
balance her checkbook, this was in the days before online banking, pay her bills, and budget her money so that she would have enough funds left over to pay for her medications each month. We would joke that I was her CMA, her certified mother's accountant. This joking made it a little easier to talk about help she was not always comfortable receiving from me. Humor can be a powerful tool in this situation. Eventually, I got a power of attorney for property so I could make financial decisions for her. And yes, money management is one concrete way you can help. Sometimes, however, this is not quite enough financial assistance. About um, five years after I had become her CMA, my mother called me up one day and she said, I can't handle the stress of working anymore. I've taken an early retirement. Well, this was a big problem because she had retired so early, she was only going to receive $300 a month from her pension. So in a fit of exasperation, I said, I give up, you're on your own. <laughs> She replied, fine. I was, after all, about to get married. I had my own expenses and bills to pay. But not surprisingly, two months later, I found out she was about to be evicted from her apartment. I didn't know what to do. I asked many people for advice. Family, friends, coworkers, even the social worker priest at my church. And here is something that I learned. Many people who care about you and who think you're taking on too much when you try to help a family member with a mental illness will tell you it's not your responsibility. Let her be evicted, become homeless. It's her own fault. She made a, selfless, a selfish decision. They will be trying to help you. You may even be tempted to listen, but they very well may be dead wrong. Only you know what decisions you can live with. I remember one day, I sat down on my bed, pondering what the right thing to do was. And I became very calm, and it became very clear that the only thing that felt right was to help her as much as I could. And so my fiance, another family member, and I started to pay her rent each month. And I searched high and low for resources that would help as well. And a little miracle happened. About a year after we had started paying for her rent, she was awarded Social Security Disability Income. And because we'd applied right away, she got a whole year's back pay, and that covered all the time we'd been helping her. And she used that money to repay every cent we had given her. Every cent. So yes, if you love someone with a mental illness, financial issues may very well arise. And you will have to decide what you can do and what you can live with. I recommend erring on the side of generosity and kindness if you can. I also recommend that you search for financial resources that are out there, but sometimes hard to find. My mother and I found out so much, in fact, that we put together a brochure about all of the resources um, that we discovered called Linda's Guide to the Government, a resource list for people in need. And we gave copies of this to all the people that we had asked for help from who didn't know where to point us. In addition to finances, another area that can suffer when someone has a mental illness is relationships. You can help here too. Be a sounding board when issues arise. Help smooth things over with family and friends by educating them about your loved one's condition, with their permission, of course. Another area that can suffer is cleanliness and personal hygiene. This may not be an area they will always admit they need help in, but laundry, litter boxes, dishes, these can be overwhelming when you're in the middle of a deep depression. And their neglect can lead to a mess that makes it even harder to get out of a deep depression. So if you can, if you have the time and energy, you may consider helping with some of these things, or hiring a service to clean regularly if you can afford it. Most importantly, you want to develop a close enough connection so that you can easily determine 
when your loved one may be in need of additional intervention or support. Over time, my mother and I developed a daily check-in system. I would call her in the morning, say hello, and see how she was doing that day. This system one day saved her life. You see, one day I called her. She was terribly upset, and she said she had just had enough. She was done, and she hung up. And she didn't answer when I called her back repeatedly. Fortunately, her best friend, a part of the network of support we had developed, lived right next door. So I called her up and asked her to go check in on my mother. She had a key for her apartment, so she went over there, unlocked the lock, and opened the door, but the chain was on. However, the door was open just enough for her to see inside and see my mother slumped over in her chair and non-responsive. She managed to finally get the door open and called the paramedics after she found the suicide note and the empty pill bottles nearby. Had I not developed a close enough connection, a daily check-in system, and a network of support, my mother would have died that day. Because I had, she was able to have her stomach pumped in time. And even though she was a little bit upset when she woke up and realized she hadn't been successful, <laughs> she was given another chance one that eventually led to gratitude for that chance, and the therapy and medication and life experiences that led her to find some peace and happiness, and to even have the chance to meet her grandson, my son Frankie. So, there is a lot you can do to help a loved one. But don't forget to take care of yourself in the process. Your loved one may be able to draw strength from you, but you may need to draw your own strength somewhere else. Yoga, qigong, tai chi, meditation, mindfulness therapy, I tried them all. <laughs> Yoga was my saving grace, so much so that I became certified to teach it. Without yoga, I don't think I could have helped my mother as much as I did. You will need to find your own outlet to handle the stress and the worry that comes from helping someone with a mental illness. Also, you need to get educated about their condition. Learn about their medications and their side effects. Know the names of their doctors and their therapists. Make sure you're familiar uh, with their condition. And consider possibly taking NAMI's Family to Family course. This is a free 12-week course for family caregivers of individuals living with mental illness. And it will teach you even more about how to take care of someone suffering from a mental illness. So yes, there is a lot you can do to help a loved one. And it won't be easy, but it will be worth it. When my mother was dying of cancer five years ago, we both regretted that we had not had the chance to write our story down together of how we had learned to work as a team to help keep her well which in turn, because I loved her so deeply, helped to keep me well. So instead, I offer you this talk today in honor of my mother, who taught me not just how to love, to help a loved one with a mental illness, but how to love unconditionally. I hope in your journeys, you will learn to do this more quickly than I did. Thank you for listening to my talk of my proud past with my mother. I hope it will help you have a stronger future with your loved ones. Thank you.